Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the launch of our Centre of Research Excellence. So before I start, I'd just like to do an acknowledgement to country. And so I'd just like to say that the, this Centre of Research Excellence acknowledges Aboriginal peoples as the traditional, own, traditional custodians of country and their ongoing connections to land, sea and community. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is a great thing to be part of. I'm going to make my introduction really quite short because um, the our leader, uh, who Cathy Sherrington, who has been the driving force behind this, is going to give an overview a little bit later. But our focus is on uh, the prevention of fall injuries. And this is an important issue. And I'll just read out a few facts why. Because in Australia, one in three people aged 65 and over fall one or more times each year. Falls and fractures in older people account for over half of all injury related healthcare costs and falls constitute uh, the second leading cause of unintentional injury deaths worldwide. And the largest one in Australia over and above motor vehicle accidents. Falls in older people lead to $1.2 million days of hospital care at a cost of greater than a billion dollars each year in Australia. And this is going to double by 2051. So it's a big, significant issue. So why a launch? Um, normally when researchers get a grant, they go away quietly and just do it. But this is different. This is about trying to translate often what we know in research into practice. And so that's our big emphasis. And so I think we need to do this because we need to make a, a, quite a bit of noise this time around to make sure we actually go from doing our research, publishing our results, uh, but not seeing it through to practice and policy. And we, we do have a, a, a long way to go, I think. Um, as an example, uh, I did three interviews last week on radio all around Daniel Andrews' injurious fall. Important to get across because it's, you know, he did have serious injuries. But what I got from it, from my perspective, was first of all, the questions about why would somebody be researching falls anyway? You know, is it, you know, it sounds like an, an ordinary sort of an issue. Mm. Um, aren't falls just accidents? Was another point that came across. And how could someone like Daniel Andrews, who looks strong and fit, have such serious injuries from just merely slipping down the stairs? So I guess that's that we are at this point in time. So it's um, we've got we've got a fair way to go. I will just share you this. Um, I'm 64. If you can read it, um, this is my birthday card from my mother-in-law. So it just gives an idea that you know still we've got to get away across an idea that I'm one year away from being officially old. So when I do fall, people will panic. But <laughs> the idea is that we really need to get across the seriousness of our issue but in a positive way. So that's, that's where we're headed. Before I do hand over to our guest speaker, I'd just like to mention, if anyone has questions anyway through this webinar, use the Q&A section, please. So now to move on and introduce our guest speaker, we are lucky enough to have uh, Prue Goward, the Honourable Prue Howard, who uh, is a Professor of Social Interventions and Policy at Western Sydney University and a director with data analytics company, Taylor Fry, uh, with responsibilities in the firm's government work. She's also a columnist for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, and a regular commentator with the ABC. Uh, she has previously been a minister for the New, New South Wales government across a range of portfolios, including mental health, a former Australian sex discrimination commissioner and senior reporter with the ABC for 19 years. So. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Prue Goward, for talking with us today. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak at the launch of your Centre of Excellence in Falls Prevention and for that very generous introduction. Well, like most of us interested in public policy, I have long contemplated the consequences for Australia of an ageing population, watching closely the experience of Japan and Europe, and of course, as my own ageing has progressed, become more and more concerned about the inevitability, it seems, of decline and senescence where death comes as a welcome release. The demographic ageing of Australia has been the result of the declining birth rate, largely thanks to oral contraception and of greater longevity. 
within a lifetime. Our life expectancy has risen from 60 to now well into our 80s, and the gap, which is so long favoured women, is narrowing. The problem for society, and therefore for government, is the increasing increase in life expectancy has not been matched by increasing years of quality of life. For example, we just don't often live very well until we're 84, independent, playing tennis, going skiing, bustling around in our days, and then go to bed one night and wake up dead. Instead, our decline kicks in at an age not much older, it seems to me, than it did for my grandparents. Knee and hip replacements have certainly been godsends. Medication keeps the pain of arthritis at bay, but decline occurs nonetheless which is why there's not only a significant nursing home population in Australia, but many more of us on aged care packages, using walkers, other mobility aids, and generally living more limited lives for what might be a quarter of our lives. According to the Europeans, the rate of nursing home use in Australia is double theirs, and they are even older. Our ageing population, as the Royal Commission has reminded us, has become a very expensive population and we pay dearly for this prolonged senescence. As we baby boomers move into decay, frailty and death, I count myself in this group, aged care will need to rely either on more taxes paid by our children uh, or much greater use of the assets of the elderly and just forget the kids' inheritance. Neither has much electoral appeal and governments have obviously put off the day when they have to face this difficult funding decision. As a baby boomer of a certain age myself, I have watched with horror as the debate has raged always based on the assumption, um, assumption that frailty, incontinence and dementia are inevitable. Our sedentary lifestyle, it seems to me, hastens this decline and the overuse of hospitals, as Stephen has alluded to, by those of age 65 or more, particularly for subacute or preventable conditions, is particularly striking. It is not just those in nursing homes who cost us money. The younger of the age cohort are also disproportionate users of our extremely expensive public hospital system. It is now absolutely then the right time to challenge this trajectory and to insist that public policy play a part in preventing or deferring physical frailty. Prevention is, we know, a much better result for everybody, far preferable to a diminished life in front of the telly, waiting for someone to help us with our washing or our bathing or our dressing, inevitably being accompanied by falls or some other acute episode, which ends up in a month long stay in a hospital followed by more months in rehabilitation centers and then maybe a nursing home. So yes, we do need very much to have a focus on falls because these so often precipitate a crisis. But we also know that falls in the older age group are the consequence of declining balance, reduced muscle mass, osteoporosis. So they are also predictors of other conditions, comorbidities associated with aging. The risk of reduced muscle mass over the, in the over 60s, for example, that risk is actually 100%. For osteoporosis, that starts to happen from the age of 50. So not only does reduced muscle mass strengthen uh, well, muscle mass strength matter for a whole lot of uh, everyday bodily functions, including posture, continence, and even the way we breathe. It is especially important in reducing the risk of falls. It's a certainty if you're over 60, you are inevitably at greater risk of a fall because your muscle mass is declining. In Australia, as Stevens uh, referred to, falls account for a stunning 37% of injury-related injury deaths and 41% of injury-related hospitalisations across all age groups. And no second prizes for guessing as Australia ages, so that rate of falls is increasing. If Australia continues to have 72% of its over 65s either overweight or obese, with only 35% considered sufficiently active, then these numbers clearly won't go down. down. Yet today's answers to preventing falls, I have to say as an older person, are not only not inspiring, they're bleak and depressing. Walkers, grab rails, special toilet seats, and of course, being told not to do things. I've been painting houses and cutting my own hedges on ladders 
for most of my life, life. Now I'm being told by every doctor I consult not to do any such thing. Well, while there's a risk with everything, how much better if we were to encourage exercise more, not allow people uh, to slide into less uh, exercise as young 50-somethings tend to do. Exercise regimes that maintained our muscle strengths, Tai Chi or yoga for our sense of balance, all will enable us to do stuff and for longer. Then how much happier would we oldies be than instead just watching television in electric recliner, recliner chairs because our core strength by now is so poor, it's finally given up the ghost and we can't even get out of a chair without assistance. There's a lot to be said for aging disgracefully, but you need to be fit to do it. Policymakers and health insurance companies, it seems to me, no longer have anywhere to hide. The science in this case is most definitely in. A big part of the answer is exercise, not, not, describe, not dis discounting the role of genes and drugs and medication, but exercise has a lot to do with it. Let's take the age at which we reach the disability threshold, defined as the point where we need help with daily activities such as bathing, dressing and cooking. For families, this is where adult children start turning their minds to moving mum into a retirement village, attached to a nursing home very helpfully and with a buzzer around her neck. Home care is arranged and the final descent has begun. But it need not be like that. As a study drawn from the Australian Women's Longitudinal Health Study found, while the average age at which women, for example, reach that disability threshold, while that average age is 75, once you take into account activity levels, it is actually a huge range from 70 for low activity women to 84 for high activity women. So there's a 14 year gap you can buy yourself in terms of your independence, depending on how much you exercise. And exercise is free. Sure, some health funds already provide free gym, gym membership, but we're not talking running marathons here. We're talking daily exercise such as brisk walks, a decent amount of gardening and lifting, walking to the shops. The weight gain associated with declining activity, as we know, only discourages activity further. I can think of many old gardeners who are still fit and flexible well into their 90s. And when it comes to staving off osteoporosis, it can be more about taking calcium and potassium supplements. Weight bearing exercise is also de demonstrated to contribute to bone density and certainly help burn off those calories. So why not give everyone a set of four kilogram dumbbells on their 50th birthday, as well as sending them an envelope to do a poo test? I'm not saying moving people off the couch and out the door is easy. We know it's not. And we know that public health authorities have tried many times before, who can forget Norm and the Life Be In It campaign 40 years ago. But we also know in 2021 a lot more about motivating people, designing financial incentives that can lead people to make exercise choices, creating programs that make exercise pleasurable, sociable and easy. Now, I don't know what I don't know because I'm no expert unlike everybody else at this seminar. But you, as the Centre for Falls Prevention, are in a wonderful position to find out what will get a country of middle-aged people to invest in their bodies in the same way as they are investing in their superannuation and with the same acute interest to get their parents off the couch and onto the footpaths before it is all too late. In the 1980s, the Grim Reaper AIDS advertisement shook Australia to the core, but it led to Australia having a world-class AIDS prevention effort. It was also frightening and many said far too extreme. But it is time we started to talk in similarly dramatic terms about the responsibility each of us owes to our own bodies, to age well. Give us hope, we need to be given hope that if we invest in our bodies, a happier and more independent old age will be our reward. And the alternative is, well, as I say, truly depressing. That surely is the great challenge of public health today, aging strong. 
the contribution of your centre to that great goal will also contribute to the well-being, happiness and prosperity of future generations and our children's children will thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pri, for that uh, wonderful perspective. I wish we could have had that transcript in our application. I mean, it really sums <laughs> up exactly what we're trying to do. So thank you very much. And it's a great segue to our next speaker, which is Cathy Sherrington, who is leading this uh, initiative. Uh, Cathy is from the University of Sydney, and she's going to give an overview of our CRE program. Excellent. Thank you very much, Stephen. And um, thank you so much, Prue, for that um, incredible opening where I'm so grateful to have you here and um, it's really music to our ears, your words. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to give um, a bit of an overview of the centre. Um, so we might have the next slide. And so this is in the, um, the context of uh, really global ageing, um, as Prue's mentioned. Um, and so it's very clear that the proportion of older people in the global population is increasing and continuing to increase. And so we need to look at this um, positively. Um, so I um, attended um, last week the launch of the um, uh, WHO and UN report on global report on ageism, where um, they said that we really need to be looking at this as the silver dividend rather than the silver tsunami. But it is the case that our health systems are going to need to do things differently with regards to um, caring for older people and falls prevention is a crucial part of that seem to be having a little issue with our slides. Hopefully they'll be coming along soon. Um, so but basically in Australia, um, we're actually not doing all that well. So the um, proportion, the uh, rate of falls related injuries. So here's our aging population. Thank you. So we can see the increase, the green there is the um, proportion of um, people age 65 and older in the global population. And then the next slide shows the um, uh, some figures about um, hospitalizations for falls in Australia. So each year over 100,000 people are hospitalized for a fall and those rates are actually increasing. Um, so 3% a year for men, men and 2% a year um, for women and these are the age adjusted rates with injuries to the hip and thigh and head injuries being the most common types of injuries from falls. And we can see on the next slide that um, that rate is particularly increasing in those older, older, pe those older old people, the um, people aged 85 and older. And the rate is actually uh, substantially higher in those people than in the younger older people. So in terms of trying to do something about this, we um, put together an application for the NH and MRC for a centre of research excellence that we were fortunate enough to be funded. Um, and so this is our chief investigator team. Many of, in fact, most of these people are here today. Um, and it's a very multi-institution, multidisciplinary team. Um, so we have people with backgrounds in physiotherapy, like myself and also Terry Haynes. Um, we have people with um, backgrounds in physiology, uh, rehabilitation medicine, um, physical activity research, uh, endocrinology, epidemiology, um, and also uh, geriatric medicine, and also health economics as well as um, sort of particular expertise in a number of subtopic sub areas. We also have an incredible group of associate investigators, also very multidisciplinary, um, also people from geriatric medicine, physiotherapy, um, orthopaedic surgery, as well as um, uh, content expertise in um, data modelling, in um, biostatistics, in clinical epidemiology, and also in qualitative methods. And we're going to hear from um, some of our investigators um, later on today. Um, through the CRE funding, we've been um, lucky enough to be able to um, support a number of impressive uh, staff. 
Um, and so there's a little bit more on our track record and probably why we were successful in gaining that NH and MRC funding. And so our chief investigators have actually published a thousand publications in the past five years. Um, and 20% of these already involve some type of collaboration with two or more investigators being involved. Um, six of our chief investigators have um, articles cited more than 10,000 times and four more than 20,000 times. Um, each of the chief investigators has career funding from the NHMRC um, of over $10 million, with uh, that being over 20 million for seven of our chief investigators. And we also have clinician researchers from seven different health services um, involved. Um, but as um, Stephen said, you know, we, we need to do more. We need to be able to have a greater impact um, and actually be able to try and influence that rate of falls and fall injuries in Australia. Um, and so with the CRE funding, um, we're able to provide some salary support to um, some postdoctoral fellows from our various institutes. Um, and so Morag and Jasmine uh, from Mura, um, Suzanne's from Flinders and Juliana and Marina from the University of Sydney where I am. Um, we've been able to provide some PhD scholarships to Vanessa and Rick, um, and we'll have more PhD scholarships to come. Um, so stay tuned about those. Um, and we've been able to fund Sandra um, to be our CRE manager to keep us all on track. Um, so the next slide. We're also um, very keen to collaborate with um, other researchers. So we were only allowed to name 20 people in the application, but there's a number of other um, leading Australian researchers with um, very relevant um, expertise who we already collaborate with in some way. Um, and we're keen to sort of bring these people under the, um, the CRE umbrella and you know, work out how we can use the CRE to greater, to collaborate and to, to work together for greater impact um, and so here's some of the people that have already um, indicated that they're keen to work with us as well. Um, we've also um, got some advisors and we're also keen to expand those and um, several of these advisors are on the call today so thank you very much. Um, we've got advisors from the UK, Canada, um, the US and also New Zealand. Um, we're also very keen to um, work with um, policy and practice groups, so with other organisations that have um, similar interests. Also fantastic to have these people on the call today. So, so far with um, the Clinical Excellence Commission, with COTA and also with Brain Injury Australia. But again, we're, we're keen to expand um, you know, those, um, those contacts as well. And um, so the next slide is, I think, about the research aims of the CRE. So there's basically four different aims. Um, and so the first one is about really trying to better use existing data to be able to identify effective and cost-effective solutions for preventing falls injury. Um, and so far, we've got projects planned um, from the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health, um, the Australia and New Zealand Hip Fracture Registry, as well as further analysis of a lot of our previous trials, um, as well as extending our meta-analyses further. Um, you know, many people in involved have um, you know, undertaken meta-analyses and also Cochrane reviews in this area. So the next thing is really about consulting and working with people. No, just go back. Thank you, Sandra. Um, so the next um, aim is about um, really working with people to design better strategies for both implementing interventions that we already know that work, um, as well as developing new interventions for areas where there is uncertainty with how we can best prevent falls. Um, and so we're very committed to co-design, so to really consulting clinicians, consumers um, and managers and and um, health funders um, about the really practically how can we actually do better with implementing these strategies. And we've already started doing this um, with regards to falls in hospital inpatients and outpatients, um, as well as with using telehealth in both residential care and community settings. And then the final two aims are about um, actually the, uh, doing large scale trials to really test interventions. 
And so aim three is looking at places where we actually do know what to do, where we have the evidence for how we can prevent falls, but we need to actually evaluate the best way to implement that. Um, and so the, these are going to be beyond the current CRE funding, but the CRE can um, give us the impetus to work together and help us be more organised about addressing these and undertaking these studies. Um, and so far, um, CRE members and collaborators have um, put in three um, applications to the Medical Research Future Fund about different uh, methods for implementing evidence-based interventions. And then the fourth part is really new pragmatic interventions. So in some areas, we actually don't really know um, what to do. Um, and so we've put a further um, MRFF application in looking at telehealth in residential care to better deliver physiotherapy services. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide. Thank you. And so, um, as we mentioned, really capacity building, collaboration and dissemination are key aspects of the CRE. Um, and so, so far, we're um, planning a, a series of early to mid-career um, career development and um, networking opportunities um, in conjunction with the Australia and New Zealand Fall Prevention Society. We've um, also planned a um, series of seminars. So the, the main way that we'll be communicating and seeking input um, on the CRE projects um, is to have seminars every six weeks. We'll have an online seminar that all are welcome to. Um, and the first of these will be on the 6th of May. Um, we'll also be using our website and newsletter to disseminate research results, as well as to be um, highlighting further collaboration opportunities. Um, and as I mentioned, we're keen to expand those policy and practice links. And we're also keen for um, ideas from anyone here today about what else we could do to facilitate collaboration to the next slide. Um, and so we'll be communicating by Twitter and by Facebook, as I said, and by our website. And then um, if you'd like to get involved in some way, to get involved in one of the projects or to offer some sort of assistance or to subscribe to the newsletter, um, then please use this email address to um, get in touch. And then just to mention a couple of other events. Um, so as I said, really, we are very collaborative and a number of us are involved in other organisations as well. Um, and so as well as our research seminar coming up from the CRE on the 6th of May, I'll just mention the um, New South Wales Fall Prevention and Healthy Ageing Network having a, um, a virtual forum on the 30th of April. The Australia and New Zealand Falls Prevention Society um, having its conference also online later this year and also just mention the um, safe exercise at home website that um, myself and a number of um, other physiotherapists from around the country um, put together at the time when COVID um, lockdowns were really um, you know, kicking off um, and this is really providing very practical information about how people can safely um, undertake exercises at home and the type of exercises that have been um, found to prevent falls and so it's freely available there's a booklet that overviews the information that um, people are very welcome to download and use. And um, just actually today, a um, Portuguese version of that, of that has been uploaded as well to um, you know, really try and um, you know, better support um, people in other countries such as Brazil who are you know, really struggling still with, um, with COVID at the moment. Um, so that's all I had to say. So um, yeah, just um, thank you very much everyone for your contribution today. And um, I look forward to um, working with you over the next five years. Thanks very much. Thank you, Cathy. That's a, a wonderful overview and uh, lots of work ahead uh, for all. all. Right, we're gonna move now to what we call a five by five. So we've got five of our um, investigators and they've all got five minutes and their, for their perspectives. And the question that's been asked is, what more could we do to prevent falls and fall injuries? What more do we need to know? So the first speaker uh, is Professor Jackie Close from Prince of Wales Hospital and uh, Neura in Sydney. And so over to you, please, Jackie. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, and good morning, everybody. So as you know, we were set two questions. What more could we be 
doing, particularly around um, implementation? And then what more do we need to know predominantly from a, a research perspective? So, so just focusing on implementation, I guess for me, I, I've broken it down into three areas, availability, accessibility, and um, acceptability. So if we take the simple way of implement, uh, of talk about implementation, we'll argue that we haven't got enough programs. So we know what the evidence is, particularly around exercise interventions. We just haven't rolled out enough exercise programs across the country. Um, well, there's an element of truth to that. Um, and certainly from a New South Wales perspective, stepping on has been our chosen um, program, which is of course not just an exercise program, but the evidence to date would suggest that we haven't offered it to enough people. We don't have the capacity to offer it to enough people. But then the question is what actually falls is a complex problem. It's certainly a costly problem, but who actually owns the problem? And, and should we really be expecting health to take ownership and be the only partner in terms of rolling out these programs. At some stage, older people themselves need to take responsibility and accountability for their own health. Um, and also the funding models in Australia don't necessarily lend themselves easily to the approaches you want to deliver effective um, falls prevention intervention. So they're different to chronic diseases where the funding models are more supportive if you have diabetes, you have GP management programs, you have specialists in diabetes, you have diabetes nurse educators, etc. So the chronic disease model doesn't lend itself terribly well to falls prevention, where ideally the, in, the way into health is probably through allied health rather than through the, med, the sort of typical medical type approach. But we also need to see uh, private health insurers probably stepping up and doing more in the area of offering effective falls prevention um, strategies. When we think about accessibility, we need to account for Australia being a very diverse um, and large country. And we have many regional and remote areas where delivering exercise interventions is enormously challenging. I think we are now starting to embrace technology and be more creative at how we deliver um, our programs, I think standing tall um, using iPad technology is a very good example of how we have potential to increase our reach by embracing um, technology. And I think over the next five years, that's an exciting, it'll be an exciting time in terms of seeing um, how we use technology um, in a much more effective way. And I think COVID has helped us um, think differently about our traditional models of care. And I know that with stepping on being put on hold uh, during COVID, there has been an attempt to develop stepping on virtual. I don't know the results of that at this point in time, but again, it's just evidence that we need to be able to be adapt to adapt to changing environments. And the final area in terms of implementation is really acceptability. We need to know a little bit more about those motivators that enhance the uptake of our interventions. Um, we need to give people options. We don't all choose to take our exercise in the same way. That's absolutely fine. But I would argue that we're still siloed in our thinking and we're very condition and problem focused. And that doesn't really reflect the reality of life for the older person. So if they happen to have diabetes and heart failure and at risk of falls, the last thing they want to be doing is going to an exercise class one day for diabetes and then off to the heart failure exercise class and then the falls exercise class. So I think from a health system perspective, we really need to move away from a problem focused um, approach to a person um, focused approach. If we then move on to what more we need to know, I, I put out a plea for people designing trials that those trials are actually pragmatic. Because if they are effective, we need to think through how do we embed them into our existing healthcare model and the funding environment in which we are required to operate. Now, we don't have to like the way our health system is set up or the funding models that support it, but they're not going to change in the foreseeable future. So we really need to be thinking pragmatically in terms of when we're designing trials to make sure that actually we have thought through if this is effective, how do we embed it 
into our existing um, healthcare system and how will the funding model that currently exists support the generalizability and sustainability of trials. So that's a big plea, trials that are pragmatic. Um, injury prevention and people and management um, in people with dementia. So I guess that's something dear to my heart. Um, we know that people with dementia are far more likely to fall. Um, they're far more likely to sustain a hip fracture. And we also know that they do considerably worse in terms of their outcomes following injury. So I'd like to see some more research looking at how we best work with people with dementia um, who have sustained an injury so that we give them the best chance possible of recovering from injury. Um, and you know, are we creative enough in terms of the way we interact with people with dementia? Are our staff adequately skilled to get the best out of people with dementia? And certainly the data would suggest to us that there is huge variability in terms of access to rehabilitation for people with dementia across this country. So a lot more work to be done in that area. And it is one of the areas of focus for us in the next five years. And my final um, plea is big data. So our health systems are incredibly rich with data, but perhaps not as rich when it comes to turning that data into useful information and action. We are starting to see big data coming to the fore and people creating electronic cohorts using data linkage, pulling together our hospital administrative data sets with Medicare and, and PBS and residential aged care systems. And when you do that, it's an incredibly cost efficient way, number one, of identifying variation. It's a very good way of triggering research questions. And equally, it's also a very good way to evaluate the impact of an intervention. So there's my three pleas for research, trials that are pragmatic, more in terms of injury prevention and management for people with dementia, and better use of big data systems um, across our healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. And just a reminder, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we will come to them at the end. Going to move now on to uh, Professor Fazi Naganathan. Uh, he's going to give his perspective. He's from University of Sydney Concord Hospital. Um, thanks, Stephen, and thanks, Kathy, for asking me to speak. Um, I thought I might answer or try to answer Kathy's questions in this way. Um, let's take three groups of people that we commonly see and think about preventing falls and preventing injuries. So that's people living, uh, older people living in the community, older people that we see in hospital, and so as geriatrician, that's what I do a lot of, and people who are living in residential care. And then really, Kathy's questions really sort of come to two main points. Do we need more evidence? What are the challenges in implementation? And I might put a third question in there, which is how do we measure success? So how do we measure the success of our application of the evidence to these three groups of people? So we've, when it comes to community living people, I'm not sure there's a whole lot more we need to know about how to prevent falls and prevent falls injury except as Jackie mentioned, in people with cognitive impairment. There's really good evidence for exercise, thanks to the work of people like Kathy and Stephen. There's pretty good evidence that if you address risk factors, such as medications, you can prevent falls. And there's really good evidence for osteoporosis treatment to prevent fractures. So I think we've got a pretty good idea of how to prevent falls and falls injuries in people living in the community, except in people with cognitive impairment. The problem, of course, and this has been a problem for a while, is how do you scale these interventions up? How do you get a large proportion of people to do balance and strength exercises? How do you identify people at risk of falling? Who would you target? Now, one of the problems is that 
when people have done trials on the cheap, as it were, when I say trials on the cheap, I mean trials say that assess for risk factors and then don't take charge of applying the evidence, they've generally been negative. And the problem with that is it means that we, in a way, we're stuck with the evidence which suggests that you need pretty intense evidence interventions or you need interventions where someone's really guiding you through the exercise programs which are all resource intensive for it to be effective and the challenge in the real world is how can you do this in a cost effective way and it's great to see that the CRE have really taken on this challenge how can you apply the evidence in the real world in a cost effective way even with osteoporosis treatment, which you think would be the simplest thing to do, we're still a long, we've still got a long way to go in terms of people who would benefit from osteoporosis treatment getting the treatment. With community living people, so how would you measure success? Well, ideally, you'd measure success looking at the big data and you'd notice that there'd be less people coming into hospital with falls and falls related injuries. And you could argue that that's a very ambitious target to have. Perhaps more modest targets would be that you would, you would see that more people are taking up exercise. And in general practice, you'd see that more people are having false risk factors addressed and more people on treatment. When it comes to people in hospital, we still need, ev we still need better evidence about what works in preventing falls in hospital. Uh, implementation has always been a challenge in this area, and that's probably why it's been difficult to prove what interventions work uh, in terms of preventing falls in hospital. But measuring success actually isn't that difficult because we're really good at keeping track of our falls rates within the hospital. The other challenge in people we look after in hospital is once they're discharged, we haven't really got great programs that we can put them in to continue to help them do the things they need to do to prevent falls. Um, the same might apply applies to people living in residential care. There's limited evidence about what works to prevent falls. Uh, the two things that have been shown are vitamin D and there's some good studies showing that um, uh, exercise, uh, even in older frail people, can prevent falls in this setting. Um, implementation, I've got mixed views on it. Um, implementation has certainly been difficult in hospitals, but in residential care, they actually have pretty good processes about trying to uh, implement change in this setting. And certainly it's easy to measure success within uh, residential care. So I feel like the CRE really is on the right track and, and is taking up the challenge of how do you implement falls prevention and falls injury prevention measures in the real world. And I put the challenge on us is to even go the next step and really take on that challenge using the big data we've got on how we can measure whether we've been successful in implementing uh, our falls prevention strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Vazi. We'll move straight on to the next speaker, uh, Mr. Matt Jennings. And, and Matt is from Southwestern Sydney Local Health District. Thanks, Stephen. Um, and thanks for asking me to um, participate in this today. It's very exciting. So I think we all agree that falls are a huge issue. We've had um, a multifactorial sort of um, problem, which um, I think needs to shift to what sort of Prue and Stephen led with, which is about this process of trying to keep people healthy and um, reduce injuries from fall. I think we do a lot around the optimal clinical management of falls and, and how we manage people after they've fallen, but we really do need this shift back towards prevention. So, like true fashion, Kathy knows me well. I don't know whether I've really answered the question, but 
what I think we need to really understand is um, if we split this CRE and the purpose up is why people are falling, what strategies we can help, you know, put in place to help pre prevent people from falling and how we do that, but then also um, not lose sight of um, what interventions actually can reduce the impact or the severity, such as those with osteoporosis. There isn't really a single bullet. And just to give you all some context, this is something that we look at in Southwest Sydney and like a health in brief that we look at regularly. And we've never had falls as part of this dashboard up until a couple of years ago. And we've had to argue very strongly to raise the profile, as people said, about the issue that we have with fall. And just to give you an idea, you can see, um, you know, there's rates of community, um, older people reporting falls in that year and around about that one in um, four sort of measure that people talk about. We have at least 26 hospitalizations a day in South West Sydney alone. And I think that's probably underestimated. And it means we get about 10,000 people through just in Southwestern Sydney into hospital each year. We see that there's low rates of physical activity. Um, but more importantly, if we think of those people who are hospitalised, there's even more of those people who fall that come to emergency departments. Of those that come by ambulance, there's even more that ambulance leaves at home or attends to and then leaves at home. And then on top of that, there's the majority or the vast majority of people who fall probably don't even call the ambulance or get to that stage. So this is a huge community problem that I think we really need to sort of get a hold on. I've got three ideas I think I want to share in terms of how I think we could do things better and um, make a bigger impact. So the first thing I've put is around a broader focus on prevention. So this isn't something that the others have talked about, haven't talked about already. But there's multiple risk factors for falls and we need to think about how we um, bring those things together. It is mobility and sits and trips, but we can't leave off things like vision, you know, continence, the environment itself. Sometimes I think the environment's left off a little bit too much. Um, and also I think a number of people have talked about the other impacts of falls. So we do talk about injury and as health systems and health researchers, most people do focus on the impacts at an injury level. So around fracture or head injury is an example that we talked about before. But there's a huge impact of, of, of falls on the community around that progression of frailty that sort of Pru um, has alluded to. The pain that people um, have after falls, psychological impacts, um, we've lost confidence and, and reductions in socialization, etc. So there does need to be that as well. I agree with Jackie around bigger uh, and better data and the use of that data. And I'd like to put a plug in around that broader future prevention aspect as well. So yes, we're looking at, at prevention at this point, but we can't forget that across the lifespan approach about um, engaging people and not losing them in physical activity, smoking rates, alcohol consumption, nutrition, et cetera, that we, we have as a broader health system. I know that we did say at some stages we are, we are injury focused. So there are um, things like with osteoporosis where it's very important where falls prevention fits, but we don't necessarily tie those things and translate those activities as well as we could together. Um, and then obviously there's other stakeholders. And the one that I don't think we've mentioned much is around industry and, and ambulance and, and also the council and community things that I know Kathy's really starting to push. So the second thing, um, and my second point is just around this co-design concept. So a lot of these grants, a lot of the talk that we have here um, is around co-design, but sometimes it can be a bit tokenistic. We really do need to embed a, a true culture of co-design around those other partners. So the clinicians are going to be, we've talked about the difficulties with translation. We've talked about the fact that the health systems to make it pragmatic and actually make it fit with what we're trying to do, there has to be input at that early stage. I don't think we use our consumers and community, even though they do bring a different perspective enough to engage them and get some of this learning or this understanding at the community level about how big a problem this is. And it helps to researchers then to ask those questions in, in a better way and sometimes better define our problems. I think that's where we're gonna end up with in terms of better outcomes. I think that's much more likely then to get a real world impact and, and have those differences um, that, we're, that we're all after. And the third point, um, again, is something that Jackie um, had alluded to, but we do really need to keep this focus on individualised care. So falls are very complex. Um, and I think one of the things that we don't do well in terms of translation is matching those interventions um, to the um, right person. So there's all the risk screening assessment, there's multidisciplinary input, 
in a health context, we look at goals, care plans, but any intervention we put in place really needs to fit what that person's issues or, or concerns are. And we need to make sure that we work with individuals and, and family and carers to sort of get that right. So these are big things, but this is a great opportunity. You know, there's a, it's a great partnership. There's a huge amount of momentum in this space and look forward to seeing this sort of really drive some improvements in the health in the community. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. We'll move straight to the next speaker. And I mentioned five, five, fives, but Maria, if you could do a, a four minute talk, given our schedule, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, great. I'm talking about um, really rehabilitation, which is at the sort of injurious falls end after fractures. That's what we look at. And, um, you know, the big one being hip fracture. So WHO has launched a, a campaign, which is uh, Rehabilitation 2030, where, um, you know, they're attempting to get universal access to rehabilitation around the world and calling on countries to try and ensure that they meet not just the pillar of um, mortal improved mortality and morbidity, but they try and improve function. And uh, rehabilitation is an enabler for that. So uh, I think we're quite a long way away from having universal access to rehabilitation after uh, fall-related fractures. But I think one of the problems is that there's a, a little bit of a, a gap in the way that we're messaging it, in the clarity of, of what sort of program should be delivered and to whom. So um, uh, one of the things that I think um, we probably need to do is to address both the gaps in the models and the gaps in the uh, actual evidence. Um, I, I guess I, I do tend to think you, you get a little bit what you pay for. And I think it's important to understand that about 120 days after injury, some of the reports, you know, a hip fracture, some of the reports are showing that we've still got 40% of people, older people who are still in hospital or in transition care. They haven't managed to get home. So these are very expensive um, um, treatments, which either they're not getting enough treatment, we're not getting the right treatment, but the return on investment case probably is quite strong to increase rehabilitation. And when we look at, say, New South Wales, we look at the proportion of um, the total cost, total spend that goes to rehabilitation. If you come from community, about 23% of the total spend is on the rehab end and most of it's on the acute end. If you come from, a, from aged care, from residential care, it'll be 10%. And so we'll have actually spent quite a lot of money on an, an, an anaesthetist and on a, a joint replacement, but we won't have spent much on recovery. And I think the issues in aged care are particularly thorny and we kind of have this chicken and egg argument, you know, the frailer you are, the harder it is to access rehabilitation and the poorer your outcomes. So it's very difficult to understand whether, in fact, you know, the, the rehab would be futile or whether the outcomes are the result of um, very little input. So when we look at US Medicare data, um, we, we can see data like 50% of people aren't alive at the end of 12 months who come from residential aged care. 25%, you know, who were walking no, are now no longer walking. And, you know, there becomes a debate as to whether it should be a palliative approach, whether it is really a rehab pro approach. And, and you're not quite clear as to whether if they'd had rehab, it would have been different. So I think um, these are issues where we don't quite have the right models and we don't quite have firm answers where we can clearly communicate. Um, and I think what we're hoping to do um, in this CRE is to come up with very compelling examples. I'm hoping I'm giving you a sort of taste of the sort of wood for the trees issue. Can't quite see the wood. We're sort of caught up in all small issues. But I think we want compelling evidence where we can um, hold clinicians to account, hold services to account on how to deliver um, you know, robust rehabilitation models to the right person at the right place and the, at the right time. All right, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Maria. And our final speaker uh, is Professor Julie Biles uh, from Newcastle University. Hi, Stephen, thank you. And hello, everybody. And I can be really quick, I think. I hope I've only got two slides and one message, and that is that falls follow function. So we often think about that the fall happens and it's the critical event, and then all the bad things happen after that. But I'm just going to show you some data from the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health where we compared people at the point that they had the fall and looked at what their 
um, SF36 scores were the 12 months before and the 12 months after. And we matched some non-fallers who were similar in all sorts of other ways and had a look at what was happening to their scores. If you just look at the um, top right hand graph, uh, sorry, top left hand graph, for instance, that's the physical functioning. You can see that those people start to diverge 12 months, nine, nine months before the fall. So we've actually got uh, a wide window of opportunity there and their decline continues after the fall. But there isn't, the fall doesn't create this tremendous interruption in the slope. Um, the other thing I'd say about these graphs is that this is just the, that person's first fall. So we know fallers fall frequently. So if we'd actually disaggregated those lines further according to whether it was a frequent faller or a first faller, we'd see those um, differences um, would be greater and probably the intercepts would be different as well. Um, what you can't see very well there is that the injurious falls and the non-injurious falls actually follow the same lines. So they're on top of each other. I think that's quite important about the, the cause of the fall rather than the outcome of the fall and the importance of function in that. Um, the other, um, and the other thing about those graphs is these are the, obviously each line is a regression to its own mean and we could either further disaggregate those lines and find the variation in there where there might be a whole lot of information. We've talked about falls in hospital, the longitudinal study on women's health data are linked to hospitalizations. And what I can say from that so far, we're having a look at that. And I think that falls that leads to hospitalizations are very common. Falls in hospital are much less common. And that might be because we're preventing falls in hospital very, very well. But what are we doing about function? And what happens when the people go out of hospital? We may have prevented the fall in hospital only to see it occur outside the hospital uh, because we've actually increased the person's risk by just decreasing their functional capacity during their hospital stay. And the last thing I want to say is that for future generations and getting back to what Prue said about our children and our children's children, because we have multiple cohorts here, we have the opportunity to look at the next cohort and, cohort and the next cohort. And um, in the first instance, have a look at how their falls risk is playing out. And in the second instance, with the people in their 40s, to be able to project what their falls risk might be and where our opportunities are to get in early to stop that first fall. That's from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, we've got uh, time for maybe one or two questions, I think. And I see we've got a few coming through uh, the Q&A box. So the ones we don't get to, we will include on the website. So if I could hand over to Adrian Bowman, could you pick possibly one or two questions for the panel, please? Um, good morning, everyone. There are six interesting questions. Some are quite hard, but some are of general interest. And one of general interest, I think, is what about dance programs as a method of falls prevention? Are they effective? Anyone on the panel for a 30 second answer? I'll jump in for that. Um, they've not yet been proved to be effective in randomised trials, but I think they're extremely promising and I'd be very keen to collaborate with anyone who would like to um, evaluate them further. I think anything that gets you moving, motivated and moving. One more quick question which comes from practice is <clears throat> older adults are often advised by their families not to be active. So they're actually counter to our message. How do we overcome that in our interventions and our advice in practice? I, th I think we've got a, a, a messaging problem. Most people, their sole goal when they get up in the morning is not to prevent falls. Um, we, we need to change how we sell our message and Exercise uh, is a very good way of preserving function and keeping you independent. And that's what older people care about. They don't care really about falls prevention. We're the ones that care about falls prevention. We need to talk about preserving independence, keeping people at home and with a quality of life that is acceptable to older people. So we, we have a serious issue about our message. We've got a communications challenge as well. Yeah. And with those two questions, the others will answer on the website in the newsletter. Back to Stephen. Thank you, Adrian. I think, thank you everybody for their participation and thanks everybody for joining in. I can say that, you know, our CRE is officially launched. Um, there's been some behind the scenes works, but 
it'll be all action from here. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, we invite you to watch this space as our developments um, proceed. Thank you.